You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Klaus Pontopidon. Dr. Pontopidon is an astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute. He works on the formation of planets and the origin of our own solar system. He also works as a James Webb Space Telescope project scientist. The James Webb Space Telescope is the scientific successor to the Hubble Space Telescope and the Spitzer Space Telescope. As the largest optical infrared telescope ever launched into space, it is expected to spot the most distant galaxies in the universe, dust, and molecular gas around young stars in the process of making their own planetary systems, and not least, to characterize the atmospheres of exoplanets. Dr. Klaus Pontopidon, welcome back to the program. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Klaus, uh, it exceeded my expectations. I expected beautiful images, but I was blown away. I, I was just absolutely amazed. And this telescope is just better than expected. Um, within these images that have been released over the last few days, what really surprised you? as a scientist working with this telescope? I think one of, I mean, there there's several things that surprised me. I think one of the first things that really came out was in the, in the deep field, the one that was released uh, a day early by the president. Uh, we knew that we would have a deep field. Uh, we knew that we would be, you know, about the same depth as the deepest fields Hubble did. At least that's how how it was designed. Uh, what we didn't know was, well, for one thing is, the observatory is better than expected. So that means that we're now deeper than anything that's been done before. But it was a bit of a bonus. Like we, it was not that was not the expectation. But the other thing is just the this incredible uh, detail and and the high resolution of of the image that allows us to see these distant galaxies as not just smudges. Um, but entities like individual creatures with with structures. Um, so if you zoom in on some of the some of the galaxies in the deep field, you see these uh, that some of them are, are surrounded by these little dots, and these are we think are individual star forming clusters within the galaxies that that Hubble just could never saw. And I think there's some real science there. I mean, I, this all has to be analyzed in the, in the coming weeks and months by by experts in the, in this field. But on our team, the, the, the galaxy experts, they were looking at this like, and they said, like, we've never seen this before. Um, there are some models that might predict that these early galaxies, if they should form lots of these star, star clusters. But now we see them in, in this amazing detail. And I think some of this comes from the fact that the observatory is, is actually sharper than, than was, was expected um, at, at the shortest wavelengths, down at about one micron. And that's where you really see all those, all those little blobs come up. Um, so that really surprised me how 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 many details we actually could see. Were you able to determine in the deep field image? And I know it's early to ask this question, but how far back are we looking? I mean, what is the roughly the most uh, distant galaxy in light years that that we're seeing in that image? So yeah, we we were we were able to determine um, the I wouldn't say distance, uh, more the age of the light. Um, because, so this is the thing with these kind of cosmological distances. The universe is expanding, right? So, you know, long time in the past, these galaxies emitted some light and this light has traveled to us. Uh, but in the meantime, as this light travels through the universe for billions of years before it reaches us, the galaxy that emitted that light has moved away um, like because it's, it, it's moved along with the universe. So the galaxies today are much farther away than they were when they uh, emitted that light. So, so usually we think of, of distances in terms of what we call look back time. So it's rather the, the, the time that the light has traveled, the age of the light, and that we can measure very precisely. And we, we actually did this as part of this, this release using spectroscopy, right? So the method where you take the light from these distant galaxies and you spread it out into its individual colors. And it turns out that that when these galaxies are very young and they actively form lots of stars, they have uh, they have very specific colors they emit because specific elements 
uh, emit light in specific colors. So these are called lines. Um, and there's a product in there that shows how, how this works. So we can measure, we measure, actually measured it very precisely. And I'm sure there are, there are, there are probably galaxies that are even uh, more distant than the ones we, we've, we found. Uh, but the most distant ones that we uh, looked at was more than 13 billion years old. The light, that light has traveled for more than 13 billion years, 13.1 to be exact. Now, when you look at a galaxy like that and you look at its spectra, do you just simply see the expected lesser amounts of other elements and you just see more hydrogen and helium and a little bit of lithium? Is, can you profile it that way? I mean, can you see the progress of the aftermath of the Big Bang as far as uh, elemental formation in these galaxies? Yeah, you can. Um, well, now we can. We couldn't before. So that's another thing we found out is that that the quality of the spectra is really amazing. Um, so I know you know people look at spectra and it's not as as beautiful as as the images, but to an astronomer, uh, it's the most beautiful thing because you, you can you can just look at the spectrum and you immediately know something very quantitative about the object. And one of the things that 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 we can do and that that we will do, um, or, or you know, the folks who are working on this will do over the following uh, months, is is in, do exactly that measure. Um, how many heavy elements there are in this galaxy. So the hydrogen and the helium that was formed in the Big Bang and a bit of lithium. But we detected neon and, and oxygen uh, in, in, the, in these galaxies and, and that has been formed by, by stars, uh, by some later generation of stars. And one of the things that folks will definitely look for is, is if there's less of that what what you call lower metallicity in the in the oldest galaxies to see if they're essentially more primitive or or they, they look they look like they they only had maybe a couple of generations of stars and then ultimately uh, with even deeper fields um, we'll look for for uh, areas where there's there's essentially no heavy elements. Now within um, a uh, an image like this, you know, obviously you have very very uh, marked gravitational lensing going on. And that's interesting because sometimes you can discover individual stars. I believe Arundel is the the, first, the most distant star we've ever seen because it's gravitationally lensed from another galaxy that's very distant. Can we do that with this? I mean, can we study an individual star as opposed to a galaxy as a whole using spectra? Yeah, I mean, Hubble, if, if Hubble can do it, Webb can certainly do it better. Um, so, so yeah, absolutely. It's a rare event though because uh, the star, that star, that individual star has to be aligned extremely well uh, in a certain configuration within the lens to be magnified by, I think the Arendil one was claimed to be magnified by a thousand times or more. Um, so that, that's a very sort of precise chance alignment. Uh, but yeah, sure. And, and, and we, we, we see significant um, enhancements in the galaxies that are in this field uh, by that gravitational lens. I think in, in Probably, and, and you see a lot of dots in the galaxies that you might think are, are stars. I, I'm guessing most of them are, are not individual stars, but star clusters in the galaxy. Um, and what it then comes down to is, again, you have to go and take a spectrum of the object to figure out if it is an individual star, if it's a whole star cluster. But Webb has that has this amazing sensitivity to take these spectra. Uh, and I think, I think it's one of the things that people will realize uh, that that this ability to go back and 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 measure with such great precision what's actually there, not just from the image, but from spectra, is something that's really going to blow people's minds as we go as we go down the line. Now, regarding spectra, it's not just galaxies. We also have characterized water vapor in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, a sort of vaguely Saturn-like uh, gas giant, but there is water vapor, and that heralds what we can do with um, perhaps rocky exoplanets looking for water vapor in their atmospheres. And if we can do that, then, you know, you're moving the territory of looking for life. When is that going to start? I mean, what on the exoplanet side, when, um, I mean, when are we going to see news of, of the next characterization of an exoplanet atmosphere? So I I always I can't say when there's going to be another news item at this time, but I certainly can say that that I mean there are already observations taken for for scientists of, of other exoplanets in this way, 
um, and there are a lot of them lined up in in the next year. So I don't think it's going to be long, but you know, I, I haven't seen any results yet, so I, I can't say. Now, what is the what's that look like? I mean, how many observations, individual observations for scientists, is Webb doing right now? You know, I mean, how many per day does it accomplish? Or is it just a completely random number that just depends on how much observing time is required? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it really varies depending on what, what is being done. But let's say a, a, a typical, uh, what we call a visit, which is where the observatory goes and looks at a certain object um, without going to another one. Um, uh, and... and an observing program or an experiment it can be many of those visits but a typical one like that is maybe a few hours from somewhere from between one hour and five hours um so you can divide 24 hours into that and so you you'd get maybe you know between five and ten ish programs over a 24-hour period that has some observations taken now did the deep field take quite a bit longer to accomplish well, it's one of the things about the deep field is that it was done so quickly. Um, I think everybody's really amazed by by how uh, how quickly we beat we beat records. Uh, it was uh, you'll see different numbers in the literature uh, because there's sort of different ways to skin this cat. Uh, so on the clock, uh, that 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 image, the near cam image, uh, was done in, on the clock in just over six hours. Of, of exposure time, just integrating on it, not just over six hours. That's uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes you'll see uh, you see twelve hours mentioned, and this is this comes back to what I mentioned be- uh, before. There's a lot of multiplexing in near cams. So not only does near cam have these two different cameras that sit next to each other, each individual one of those cameras actually also observes two different filters at the same time. So it, it observes two different colors of light at the same time of the same field. So in terms of depth, it, it corresp- and, and Hubble can only do one at a time, right? So in terms of depth, uh, it's like 12 hours, but on the clock, it's only six, if that makes sense. A faster observation. But then again, uh, JWST is far newer than Hubble, you know, Hubble's 1980s technology that's somewhat upgraded, but we haven't been there in a, <laughs> to visit in, a, you know, years. Um, now, the micrometeoroid impact on JWST, which almost destroyed me when I heard about it. How bad is that? And is it just something that you just have to shrug and expect? And could it happen again to that level? I know things get hit by micrometeoroids all the time, but sometimes they can be a little bit larger than uh, what you were planning for. Yeah, that, that, that's the thing. I mean, it's the, it's the size of them. So, so, so Web is built to handle micrometeorites, and it gets hit regularly. Um, and that's just you know part of the, you know, the, the, that's part of the game. Uh, and, and any spacecraft would get hit uh, regularly by micrometeorites. And that, and that, that's taken into account in also the lifetime of. I mean, we heard a lot about lifetime of fuel, right? But also the lifetime of of the mirror and so on. Eventually, it, it sort of it gets a lot of dings. Um, you know, just like a car. <laughs> you know, you drive a car for ten years. You know, you're going to have a few scratches on it. I mean, that's essentially what it is. Um, and but it'll it'll take a lot of them before you really degrade performance. Uh, what was different with with this one that you, that everyone has heard a lot about is that it was bigger and or faster, um, some combination thereof, um, than 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 what was expected, than what you typically see. And obviously, with the bigger it is, the faster it is, the more energy it hits with, and the, and the greater impact relatively it, it will have. So this did have a significant impact in the budget for uh, the, the kind of damage that micrometeorites will just do over time. Um, so that one, it did not cause any uh, real measurable difference in performance of the observatory. But the concern is that uh, if there are a lot of those uh, big, um, fast ones, then over time, then that can affect the performance. Uh, like, so it would degrade the observatory quicker than what was expected. And so uh, folks are looking at this very carefully. Um, you know, they're going back, they're looking at the models, um, they're thinking about it, and they're thinking of, of uh, if there's anything that can be done to, to mitigate this if it turns out that those are more common uh, than expected. And so they're going to come back with some answers for us, um, you know, in, in the not too distant future, I expect. Uh, but, uh, but so far, 
um, you know, the hope is that this was like a freak uh, event that, you know, a rare thing that, you know, maybe once in a, in, in, a, in a decade and we don't have to worry about it. But if it's, if it's several a year, we may have to worry about it. Could that, um, it, you know, finding out about that and learning the profile of dust in the solar system and the size of it like that, could that affect future space telescope designs? For example, would we say, well, these things hit a lot, so we're going to protect this thing more and make it more like Hubble, you know, sort of contained as opposed to being out there, you know, open to the elements, so to speak, as JWST is? Yeah, that's a great question. I um, mean, for those who've been following along, will know that um, the concept for what comes next um, may very well be something that uh, that looks like the JWST design. You know, a, a bigger telescope that works in the, in, the, in optical light, uh, but is, is big enough that, that it would be able to go out and actually take direct images of Earth-like planets. Um, and, but that would also have this big um, segmented mirror bigger than and or maybe or probably about the same size as webs but uh, and, a, and a sun shield but in order to take direct images of, of real earth-like planets the surface of that mirror has to be even more precise than than webs mirror and webs mirror is already very precise and that's where you, you have to start really worrying about micrometeorites because the more precise that mirror has to be in order to image those earth-like planets the less uh, the less it can withstand this kind of impact from micrometeorites. So you, you don't want to you know, build this fantastic telescope that can observe Earth-like planets. You send it up and it only works for a few months because then it get, just gets hit by something. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, so they're worrying about this. I'm sure. Yeah, so that 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 really shows that, that in addition to the science mission, Webb is also uh, teaching us about the conditions of space for future telescopes and will help define what, we can actually do, you know, uh, <laughs> in the future, especially with, you know, giant telescopes like the next generation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and if they, if, if they end up having to put a big tube on it, um, one, first of all, it will be very expensive. And second of all, it, it, it may limit how big the telescope can be. So, uh, so we hope not. So I hope they, they, they figure out, I'm sure they'll figure out some clever way of, of dealing with it, but, but we'll see. Well, at least we have the benefit of launch costs dropping and <laughs> gigantic, yeah. gigantic rockets coming that can launch things much, much bigger um, than web. Um, and you don't really have to fold them up so much because of uh, fairing sizes and everything else increasing. So this story is not over. There's going to be um, a whole series of increasingly great space telescopes coming. But web is the one that's going to show us everything you can now now if you had to uh, put numbers on it as far as as power you know um how much more powerful say as a percentage is webb versus hubble now i know that's a hard comparison to make because they're two different telescopes and two different areas of the spectrum but if you just had to make a general statement about how much more powerful webb is than hubble what would you uh, put that number at well, I would say it's it's orders of magnitude more powerful. Because orders of magnitude means, uh, you know, like a hundred, like much more than ten, but you know, probably less than a thousand. Um, and and the, the the reason you can say that, and and because it, you, as you write that this is a, there are many parameters you can look at as many many different ways you can you can compare things. But like just if you look at let's say the example of the the, the distant universe. Um, uh, with the, with the earliest galaxies, we are more sensitive. Even in the in the in the wavelength region where we overlap, we are far more like hundred times more sensitive in at at more, at more infrared at redder wavelength than anything that came before, which would be something like a Spitzer Space Telescope, for example. Like, like vastly vastly better than vastly that. yes. As yeah. far as infrared and, telescopes, this is <laughs> this right. is something <laughs> much much better than what we've ever had. Right, right. But the thing is that um, it doesn't make as much, if, if this is a science goal, right, it doesn't make as much sense to compare to that, that bit of wavelength where you overlap with Hubble, because that's not where you see those distant galaxies. You see those distant galaxies in the area where we are much more sensitive than Spitzer. Right. So, so to do the science, we are 100 times better or, you know, or something like that. Uh, then we're also, we're faster because we have more pixels. 
uh, like one of the things you see in the, the images that was in the first images package, for example, uh, like for example, Stefan's Quintet. This is a massive image. It's 150 million pixels. Uh, uh, it was put together um, by uh, uh, by almost a thousand individual uh, image files, and we're able to do again to do that in just a few hours. So it's and, and people have been saying in the past that on the web, you know, it's not a survey telescope. And this is true, you know, it's not, uh, you know, something that's going to look at the whole sky, but it can look at, at bigger regions and hobble faster with more pixels on sky. Um, and so that's another kind of power. Um, and then there you can you can think about the spectroscopy that you get. You know, so you have all this. You can this. It's just a, a you can't quantify that power, but the power that you can take an image and you see something weird there, something you don't understand, you know, whether that's, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, um, you know, there's some direct imaging of exoplanets and some, you may see some, some uh, you know, a blob there, you don't know exactly, is it a planet or not, or, or a distant galaxy, and you can go and take a spectrum of it and you'll just tell from that spectrum, yes, this is what it is. Um, so that's a different kind of sort of soft power. Now, in regards to the spectrum of the exoplanet where the water vapor was seen, did you see anything else? What other uh, chemical signatures were in there, if any? Um, so, uh, you can think of this. Think of it like, as this: right? um, the composition of the atmosphere is just one thing you can learn about a planet uh, when when they do when they do the spectra and they fit a model to it. Uh, that's one thing that comes out of that fit, but there, there are other things as well. Uh, so you're right. So there was clearly water there. Um, we were looking at some other things, like at shorter wavelengths. There, there, you, there, you often expect to see uh, uh, atomic gas at very high altitudes in the planet, like potassium or lithium. Uh, and we think there may be some there, uh, but there's something that requires a more careful reduction of the data. So this was something we just didn't have time to do before we, you know, this release came. So folks are already looking at the spectrum to see if they can improve things. And this is what you have to do when you're looking at this kind of precision. But other things as well, you get a temperature out. Right? So this is just, this is uh, over a thousand degrees uh, Kelvin. Uh, so you get that out of the spectrum. You get out that in fact, it does have clouds. It was uh, it was known as a cloudless planet because this is what Hubble, said, Hubble uh, observations indicated, but they just weren't good enough to really say that apparently because once we have the web spectrum, we can clearly see that it has clouds. Uh, other planets, you, you would be able to also look for volcanism or you know, whether questions whether they have a, maybe an ocean on them, uh, whether, uh, I don't know, you might even be able to go look for, for variability over time, right? So it's kind of weather where... You know, maybe they, they don't the the atmospheric spectrum will change over time with seasons or not. That's interesting because that you could literally characterize the seasons <laughs> and maybe even predict them ahead of time of an exoplanet. I mean that's that's just mind blowing that we can actually do that now. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's a lot of this kind of stuff is just gonna come out. Oh again, you know, give folks a little time, right? But you know, over the over the coming coming months and years that they're gonna because the quality of the data are like that. Um, so they open up discovery space. Right? They open up space to to find things and that we didn't expect that we could do or that were there. Like the, the basic thing you need to do stuff like that is this quality of data. It's signal to noise. It's 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 just resolution. It's sharpness. All that. And so we have all that. We, what we're showing with the spectrum is that we have that um, in just a single transit. So so I think we're a lot of people are really excited about what what uh what we can do in the future for, for other planets and this planet too to sort of dig deep into this um just as a hypothetical if we were able to get quality enough observations and the conditions and circumstances were just right you could study a planet's seasons and derive all sorts of information from that probably things like axial tilt and start answering questions about you know earth um you know what <laughs> you know how common is it the of a, a, a stable <laughs> axial tilt you know moderated by a moon how, how how common is that in the universe and that that really is is sort of one question you could ask of of jwst right yeah absolutely um, I think a lot of this is f for 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 JWST exoplanet observation is kind of really just limited by the available observing time. The main limitation is that for transits or eclipses, you know, where the planet goes behind the, the star instead of the other way around, 
is that it, it, it only happens a fixed number of times. Uh, the one we observed um, we, uh, for the first images had a period of uh, three and a half days, which made it easy for us to, to schedule it. Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have worked if we had to wait a few weeks, right? You just wouldn't have had time to do it. But some of the most interesting planets, of course, have longer periods, um, you know, especially the, the ones that are cooler, that orbit farther from their star. Uh, so you have you just have limited opportunities, and that's why it's it's actually great that we have uh, more than much more than five years, more than ten years, because it allows us to to build up knowledge of planets with much longer periods than than these hot Jupiters with with just a few days uh, to go around the star. Now, people are going to ask me about the public uh, access or availability of the data to the world scientists. How does that work? What um, can anybody, you know, especially a scientist who knows how to interpret this, go and take a look at the uh, JWST data and, you know, just have it free and clear out there for anybody of any country? Yeah. Uh, so, um Ultimately, all JWST data will become completely public. Um, there, there are some data sets that where the investigators get uh, exclusive access time, we call it, of up to uh, 12 months. But uh, you'd be surprised of how much stuff that's just going to be public right away. So like your first images, we released all of that yesterday. So, you know, you can go right now and download it and, you know, <laughs> have fun with it. Um, uh, today we are releasing um, a lot of uh, new public science data um, from the what's called the Early Release Science Program. Um, anybody who ha who gets time to do what we call a large program, which is which has um, maybe more than seventy five hours of observing time, those, that's also just public immediately. Um, the exoplanet, uh, sorry, the uh, the solar system community got together and also decided that a lot of their data would just be public immediately um just you know so so there's there's sort of this this growing um i don't know if ideology is the right word but you know this this is this growing culture in in the scientific community that data wants to be free and and we should not uh individuals should not sit on 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 exclusive data um the observatory is paid for by taxpayers of the world right or, or from many many different countries um, and so it really should be available to all. So I think you'll see there's be a lot of that. And yes, uh, for the public data, um, anybody can go to the archive and just just you know, just go ahead and download it. Uh, it may take some work to uh, to understand it uh, and figure it out. Uh, trained scientists can do that best, but there's a lot of awesome amateur astronomers out there, and you know I would just encourage them to you know to dig in and and I'm um, sure they they will be able to to do some awesome. Uh, you know, science or, you know, beautiful images or, or you know, whatnot. Even just something like the deep field image, you look in that, you know, the hundreds of galaxies, there are some really <clears throat> interesting looking galaxies hidden in that, that image. So anybody can sort of go and look. And if you do that and you're looking at this little spiral galaxy or whatever, you're seeing, you're, you're putting more attention <laughs> into that galaxy than any other human ever has just by looking at it for a, for a long time and admiring it. I, I find that pretty amazing. Yeah, um, uh, absolutely. And, and, and I, I, I happen to be like, so, so my, my role in making the first images, I, I mean, I, I was, um, I worked with a team that, that did that and I, I played a, a significant role. And one of, one of the things I had to do in, in that, in that uh, role was because of all the confidentiality about them, there was only one person who was able to uh, to download the data when they were available, to, and then to distribute it to the instrument scientists and the graphics artists who needed to deal with them. Um, that was me, so I, I got to download that deep field, uh, you know, one one day when it was available, and just sit there and and look at it for a couple of hours um, as the only person on Earth. Uh, and and I will admit that that was a that was a weird feeling. Uh, you know, looking at all those all those galaxies as as a first person, and I knew some of them would be more distant than what had been been ever done before. It's looking at the beginning of the universe. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there few things that are more weighty than that. You know, at the aftermath of the birth of the universe, visible to us. Um, so, how does it work uh, with regards to um, 
prioritizing observations now that now that we're in the science phase do you have like a basically a a, a ranking system on what gets done first versus um you know what's second tier and things like that is there is there such a system or is it more distributed yes yeah, so, so no so we, we don't have a priority system uh everybody is uh, is is equal with one exception um and that's that uh mentioned earlier the what's called the early release science program which is just in this first year um there's 500 hours of observations that were selected um from the community um, and these had the purpose of making sure that there was public data for for all the important uh, science modes uh, of the observatory and, and over a wide range of science cases so that even for those who didn't didn't get time or, you know, maybe there are students or postdocs who just came in later and, and want to ramp up and, and start doing science with with the observatory that there would be some data available for them. So those get priority, and they, but they get priority because they're public data sets. Um, and so we just want to make sure that they come out as quickly as possible within the first five months. Everything else has just this flat priority. Um, the scheduling is made um, to to make the observatory the most efficient possible. Right. So it's uh, it takes time to move from one part of the sky to to another. You know, more than half an hour if uh, if you're you know, going from one part of the sky to the opposite part. Um, and so it would be very inefficient if, if observations were scheduled according to some other priority than just, you know, making sure that we, we, we slew, we move as, as, as short distances on the sky as possible. I see. And that also saves fuel, right? So if you sort of prioritize the targets near each other, you don't have to move the telescope as much, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, well, uh, I think the, the fuel is a little more complicated, but it's taken into account as well. That's right. Now, what's next? What uh, what what can we expect in the coming month, say, from uh, GWST? Is there going to be more pretty pictures coming out or anything like that? Or is it just going to be we have to wait for the papers to be published? <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, no, there'll be more pretty pictures. Uh, we we don't we certainly don't want to sit for months and, uh, and not have something new come out. Um, I do think that uh, um, you know, the science community will be will be very quick. <laughs> I mean, it remains to be seen. I don't know if the first paper has been submitted yet or not, but uh, and uh, you know we can take bets on when that will happen. But um, uh, in the case that that we're not getting um, uh, some some awesome results from the science community in the first few weeks here. Then we are we're ready to uh, we'll put out new images and we'll do that regularly on a, on a pretty frequent um, cadence. And you mentioned on Twitter that there is such an image, at least one, and that there was another image taken that you didn't process or do anything with. You're obviously. <laughs> very busy uh, getting the images that were out. But there is at least one other image out there that somebody could process and release at any time, right? Yeah, I mean, you may be talking about that other, that little bonus deep field. Uh, so yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's available. Um, there was actually, there was another exoplanet as well in there, that, uh, other than the one we, uh, we, we, uh, we used in the press release. And that's been, that's been released as well. I'm sure folks are, folks are looking at it. So yeah, I mean there there'll be uh, there'll be uh, there'll be things. And my last question for you, Klaus. All right, so we know of an exoplanet that's very close, Proxima B. Uh, <laughs> is that is that high on the list to take a look at? Um, not to my knowledge. Uh, it's a it's a hard target. It's very that's a bright. Uh, um, uh, there's a bright star next to it, right? So, so I'm not sure actually. Yeah, that gets to be a problem when that those really, really closely orbiting exoplanets to red dwarfs. Um, all right, Klaus. Well, congratulations. This was it was an absolute pr pleasure to watch um, the flawless deployment of of JWST, and then now just the jaw dropping images and science. It's going to be a great run. Well, I'm sure. Yeah, we have a lot of lot of good things to look forward to. So, thanks for having me. It's always a blast. Yep, and uh, I hope you'll join us again at some point when uh, even more science comes out. Accumulated science and talk of JWST. Absolutely. 
Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.